Elizabeth was born in 1720 into a working-class family. She tied the knot with James Brownrigg, who was an apprentice plumber, when she was still in her teenage years. Despite giving birth to 16 children, only three managed to survive beyond infancy. In 1765, Elizabeth, along with her husband James and their son John, relocated to Flower de Luce Road, situated within London's Fetter Lane. James was making strides in his plumbing career, while Elizabeth had established herself as a reputable midwife. Her dedication to her profession led to her appointment as the overseer of women and children by St. Dunstan's Parish. Additionally, she was entrusted with the care of several female children from the London Foundling Hospital, who would serve as domestic servants under her guidance. Since its establishment by Thomas Coram in 1739, an ongoing debate had revolved around determining the appropriate role for the young charges under the care of the Foundling Hospital. The discussion centered on whether the children were receiving an excessive education or if they should instead undergo vocational training, preparing them for apprenticeships that could lead to stable futures as domestic servants. Ultimately, the latter perspective gained traction. In 1759, the Foundling Hospital began offering older children and young adolescents for vocational training as apprentices. This decision was made just before the events recounted in this account unfolded. Elizabeth Brownrigg was not the sole perpetrator of the mistreatment of unfortunate children used as forced labor, as accounts from the time indicate. Subsequent to the incidents detailed here, the Foundling Hospital implemented more rigorous oversight measures for the apprenticeship program. As a result, reported cases of apprentice abuse markedly declined, reflecting the institution's commitment to ensuring the well-being of the children entrusted to its care. Limited biographical information is available to shed light on her subsequent actions. Nevertheless, Elizabeth Brownrigg's inadequacy in the role of caring for her foundling domestic servants became evident, leading her down a path of severe physical abuse. Her cruel methods often involved stripping the young charges of their clothes and fastening them to wooden beams or pipes before subjecting them to harsh whippings with switches, bullwhip handles, and various other implements, even for the slightest infringements of her rules. Among her victims was Mary Jones, who managed to escape from Brownrigg's house and seek refuge at the London Foundling Hospital. Following a medical examination, the governors of the hospital cautioned James Brownrigg to control his wife's abusive behavior, yet they did not take any further decisive action. Disregarding this warning, Elizabeth Brownrigg continued her brutal mistreatment, inflicting severe harm on two more domestic servants, Mary Mitchell and Mary Clifford. Like Jones, Mitchell attempted to flee the torment but was compelled by John Brownrigg to return to Flower de Luce Road. Clifford, despite the previous concerns expressed by the governors, was entrusted to Brownrigg's care and subsequently endured even more extreme punishment. She was subjected to nakedness, confined to sleep on a mat within a coal hole, and when she resorted to scavenging cupboards for sustenance due to meager rations of only bread and water, Elizabeth Brownrigg subjected her to prolonged beatings while chained to a roof beam in the kitchen. By June 1767, Mitchell and Clifford were suffering from infected and untreated wounds, exacerbated by Brownrigg's unrelenting assaults that left them no opportunity to recover. As suspicions grew within the community, Brownrigg's neighbors urged the London Foundling Hospital to conduct a thorough investigation of the premises. This prompted the surrender of Mary Mitchell by Brownrigg. However, when Foundling Hospital Inspector Grundy demanded information about Clifford's whereabouts, James Brownrigg was apprehended. Elizabeth and John Brownrigg managed to evade capture. The public sentiment turned strongly against the Brownriggs, ensuring their swift apprehension. In Wandsworth, a Chandler identified the fugitives, leading to their trial at the Old Bailey in August 1767. At this juncture, Mary Clifford had succumbed to the grievous effects of her infected wounds, leading to the accusation of murder against Elizabeth Brownrigg. During the trial, Mary Mitchell, a former employee, provided testimony against her former employer, along with accounts from Grundy and an apprentice of James Brownrigg. 
the presentation of medical evidence and autopsy findings unequivocally established that Elizabeth Brownrigg's repeated acts of violence and neglect towards Clifford's injuries had significantly contributed to the tragic demise of the 14-year-old. Consequently, Elizabeth Brownrigg received a sentence of execution by hanging at Tyburn, followed by the public dissection of her body. While awaiting her impending fate, Elizabeth Brownrigg exhibited remorse and fervently prayed for salvation. However, her journey to the execution site was met with the condemnation of the crowd, who vented their abhorrence for her heinous crime through spitting and verbal outbursts. On the path leading to her place of execution, the populace expressed their repugnance for her deeds in ways that, though inappropriate for the occasion, underscored their disbelief that such a monstrous individual could exist. They offered prayers not for her redemption, but rather for her condemnation. They held no doubt that the devil would claim her, and their wish was for her to descend into the depths of hell. Such was the sentiment that pervaded the mob. Even six decades later, the crime periodical The Newgate Calendar bore witness to the lasting impact that Elizabeth Brownrigg's crimes had left on the collective consciousness of Georgian and Victorian England.